If you are looking for a way to make a child in your life smile, then you have to go to smilemakers.com and go through all the must-have toys, stickers, and prizes for kids. You'll find everything you need to make the hospital, waiting room, or even your own living room more fun with games, crafts, and prizes for every occasion. I also have very good news for you because when you go to smilemakers.com and type in on call 20, you will get 20% off with no minimum order required. So stock up on bundles made specifically for hospital procedures and therapeutic play and make these already very affordable items more affordable with on call 20. That's smilemakers.com and on call 20 for 20% off your entire order. You're listening to episode 103, a talk with an expert, Kat Harrison on living with medical challenges, disability, mental health, and chronic illness. Hello, my friends. If you got to listen to Kat's story at the end of 2021, she talked about what it was like being a teenager with chronic illness. And in part of the episode, we touched on what helped her the most when she was a teenager in the hospital and what did her parents do right? What do, what does she wish that maybe could have been done differently? And how can we specifically support adolescents who are coping with different medical or mental health challenges? So I'm so excited to share this very quick 12 minute talk with you so that you can be more prepared when you're talking to your own teenager or you're working in a field around adolescence. So thank you so much, Kat, for being here. Hello, my friends. I am here again with another 12 minute talk, which means we go over a topic that makes things easy for you to digest as a parent. So I know sometimes medical concepts can feel really complex and we want to bring you really pertinent information that you can digest very easily. And so today we have with us Kat Harrison, who has actually shared her story on the podcast before. And I asked Kat to come on because she is an expert in that she has gone through this particular topic all on her own. So what we're going to be doing is diving into the topic of how can parents empower their teens when they're going through medical experiences. I feel like Teens are not quite grownups yet. They still have a lot to learn, a lot to go through, and how we can best support them, um, I don't think could come from a better person than someone who has been a teen themselves going through the experience. So hi, Kat. I'm so glad you're here today. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Like you said, I am Kat Harrison. I am a chronic illness advocate and also a writer. Um, And just just to know about me, I live with a variety of chronic illnesses and a disability, which is kind of where I am coming from today. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate you just being so vulnerable and authentic in the way, you know, we got to hear it on the podcast before through your story. But the fact that you wanted to come back to help parents is just even more amazing. So I want to give you the floor. And, you know, the question is, how can parents empower their teens? Um, And so I'll let you take it away. Awesome. So this is a topic I feel super passionately about because I feel like teens are like the forgotten generation um, when it comes to, I quote unquote, kids with mental like challenges. Um, And I think that's because they're in this unique situation between being talked to like an adult, but sometimes being treated like a kid. And so I think they really need kind of their own way to process things and maybe a little bit different from how you would process it with a younger child. So I think my main motto through all of this is that you should always talk with your team, not at them or around them. Um, I think one of the most frustrating parts about being a teen going through a lot of mental uh, medical challenges is that I often sometimes felt like when I was in an appointment that the conversation was happening like I wasn't there. And that doesn't give a teen or really any kind of person autonomy in their care. Um, I really believe in self-advocacy. It's quite the art form and I'm still working on it today. Honestly, I don't think you ever stop kind of growing in your self-advocacy as a patient. Um, But I really, I think it's important to start that young um, and teens are more than capable of involving themselves in their appointments. Um, So on that note, um, another tip I wanted to make sure I gave is that if appropriate, you should totally let your teen drive appointments. 
Um, and I think that that's important. They should be the ones asking questions. They should be the one clarifying things. Um, they should be the one talking about their symptoms and their experiences. Um, and I think including them in that way and letting them drive and perhaps stepping in when needed um, creates like a better better dynamic. Uh, I think a power struggle, I think medical professionals, you know, are, are put on a pedestal, which, which makes a lot of sense. But I do think the patient has a lot more rights than they realize. I think it's really important to talk with your team um, with that. Um, a few other things. Oh. Oh, yeah. Let me, I have a question about that. Um, yes. One of my questions is, I, I, well, it's more of a statement. I just completely agree and think there is a lot of space for teens to be able to get involved. And kind of from the parent perspective, too, I, I think there may be some questions that I would want to ask as a parent. And not that I want to talk around my teen, but that I want to make sure are heard. Is there a way I can deliver that information? Um, like, I'm just trying to think about, like, if I'm concerned about something and I don't quite know how to explain it to my teen yet and I want to get clarity from the doctor first, would it be really offensive for me to say, like, hey, can I have a couple minutes with the doctor or um, I have a couple questions, too? What do you what's the best way for a parent to navigate that? Yeah, I think and that that makes total sense. Right. <laughs> in, in this dynamic, the parent still has, uh, you know, a lot of rights and a little bit more wisdom. Then the team, <laughs> I, I think it's really good just to prep the team for that ahead of time. Yeah. So I think it's really important to do like a pre-appointment and a post-appointment, like kind of just rundown of what you want to talk about, what it might look like, and then afterwards how it felt. And I think in that pre-appointment segment, you can say, hey, I might pull the doctor aside. Why don't you go to the waiting room and listen to your music or go on social media? Um, and I think that that's okay. It's just, I don't think it's great when things are sprung um, upon the teen or about uh, on the person actually going going through it. You know, you do want to feel like a partner, but I think it's appropriate to do that. And sometimes it is better to do it without the teen in the room. So I think as long as you set the stage, beforehand, even if it's in a very general way, that goes a very long way, I think. Oh, that's such good advice. We'll be right back. We are sponsored by Magic Mind. I am such a coffee person. I enjoy the taste and the smell in my morning routine. But the truth is I go beyond that one cup of morning joe and my two to three day cup habit is expensive and not that effective in the long run. Thankfully, Magic Mind has come into my life. It's a small green shot-sized drink of all natural ingredients like adaptogens to decrease stress, nootropics to boost blood flow and cognition, and unlike regular energy drinks, Magic Mind has minimal caffeine, all of which comes from matcha. After a few days in a row of drinking Magic Mind, I notice I have less brain fog and feel more productive without an afternoon slump. You can try it and get 20% off Magic Mind by going to magicmind.co slash childlife and using code CHILDLIFE. Okay, awesome. What else do you have for us? <laughs> I just want to okay, hear everything. The other thing, so um, a big thing I want to emphasize is it's really important. So, you know, if, if your teen has a serious diagnosis and something that you're going to be wrestling with for a while, I think it's really important not to talk about health and medical care 24-7. Um, I think, especially in the chronic illness world, there is this very blurry line with your diagnosis becoming your identity. And I think as a teen, when you're still trying to figure yourself out and you're just trying to figure out where you fit, your identity is very malleable. And I think it can be very dangerous if all dinner conversations, if all phone conversations, um, even conversations with teachers that they have to miss school, if it all revolves around the condition, I think it's very easy to lose yourself in it. And it kind of makes you feel like you're not a person anymore, but you're still a person. You like to eat certain things. You like to go to the movies, whatever your hobbies are. And um, so I think that's, that's really important. Oh, Kat, um, I, I love they, that. It's like, is that it, good? <laughs> that, that's so good because the thing that I was thinking is that as you're saying, this is literally one of Eric Erickson's who is a developmental theorist. It's the way that he explains adolescence and it's this identity versus role confusion. So the fact that you felt that as a teen and now you're giving it as advice to parents is just so right on. And I think, you know, 
we're constantly trying to figure out who we are. And that really comes mm-hmm. to fruition during those teen years. And so I think you're so right. And and me as a mom and me as a child life specialist, I want to be more than just these roles that I play too. So I think it's easy Absolutely. to find some empathy for your teen when you think about yourself going through these experiences. Definitely. Definitely. Um, one other thing, if we have time. Yes, absolutely. Um, I wanted to, okay, I wanted to touch on mental health. Um, and I, I think that it's much more nuanced, I think, than just asking your teen how they feel. I think it's very important to realize that no matter the physical condition or the diagnosis, it will affect someone mentally. It will affect someone mentally in a variety of ways, in ways you may see and ways you may not see. And I think it's very important to proactively have conversations, asking your teen how they feel, how certain aspects feel, but also respecting their boundaries, right? If they don't feel up to talking, don't push it. Um, allow them to process things in their own way. Sometimes I find that's actually healthier than just kind of prodding someone to asking how they feel. Um, I also think, I don't know if you've ever talked about toxic positivity on your podcast before, but I really, really encourage parents to limit it. Um, I think it's really, it's really healthy to allow teens and really any human being to feel what they're feeling. You know, um, I think normalizing the idea that depression and anxiety or, an, or any other kind of mental health challenges absolutely can accompany a serious diagnosis. It makes a lot of sense. So, so try not to say things like, it could be worse or it will all get better. Um, it, it doesn't usually help. It usually harms the teen. Mm. Oh, totally. And I feel like when we say those things, we're trying to make them true. (laughs) And they're not necessarily true. Like we can't say for sure this is a fact. Um, So I think that's that's such good advice. Do you have anything else you'd like to share for parents? Yeah, I think one more thing that I just want to say is it's always good to ask your teen how they would feel best supported. I think oftentimes, um, Parents can make the mistake of just assuming they know the best way to support their child. And while that's a very valid thing, and I think that, you know, it's kind of like a whole other topic for a whole other day, (laughs) I feel like in situations like this, you don't, you don't know what your teen necessarily needs. Do they need space? Do they need a distraction? Do they need to see their friends maybe a little bit more? Do they need more family time? It, 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 ask them. (laughs) Ask Mm. them if they want special things for meals, if they're allowed to have it. And I think that, again, that really goes towards that autonomy in the process, making them feel like they have a say, um, as opposed to just kind of being guided through an experience they didn't want to be in. Um, So I I think that that, it all kind of ties together in a way, but I think taking that framework and that mindset just sets your family up for, for better success through what's likely going to be a very tough time. I agree. I feel like even now, just as a mom to young kids, I feel like I should know best exactly what they need, but I really have to Mm -hmm. do more listening. And that just gets more important the older kids get. So they feel like they have a voice. And I think that's perfect. Thank you so much. Yes, you're so so welcome. And so Kat, you uh, are also an author. So could you share with parents where they can find some of the books that you've written and, and connect with you? Yes. Um, so I have two picture books out. The first one's called Surgery on Sunday. And my most recent one is called Migraine and Mia. And they can be bought anywhere where books are sold, especially online. And then I also have a website, which is cat with a K writes for you.com where I sell signed copies as well. And then on Instagram is really the best place to find me. And my handle is XOCAT. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And I know you've given a lot of wisdom to parents and I really appreciate it. Yes, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Child Life on Call podcast. I'm your host, Katie Taylor, and you can follow us at Child Life on Call on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please rate and review to make it easier for other families to find us. We have cute merch available at www.bonfire.com slash store slash Child Life on Call. And you can listen to more episodes and find resources at childlifepodcast.com.